welcome to Mission Creek Church. Would you please stand and join us as we worship our Lord and Savior? just thank you that we can come here and worship you. Lord, I just pray that you would just bless this time. In your name we pray, amen. Be my guide, God of Abraham, lead me by your hand, you are strong and wise. I want to trust.
Father God, I thank you that we are yours. Lord, I just pray now for the rest of the service, Lord, that you would just be with Jesse as he gives us your words and your scripture. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
Good evening, everybody. How's your guys' week going? Good. Uh, before I get started, before I pray, I just want to say um, we had a great class today. Um, Jared brought out a bunch of guys from Teen Challenge. And did you guys like it? Yeah? Good. So that was a blessing. Uh, we had a full room back there. Um, and so that was just a real blessing for us. And uh, and also, too, um, there's a couple new faces here. Um, there's Patrick and Elizabeth, right? I uh, met Patrick at the gym, so make sure to say hi to him before you leave. <coughs> Patrick. All right. Um, so let's get into prayer, and then we'll get to the message. <coughs> Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for these brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray that you you guide my heart and my words, and I pray that your your truth is spoken to these these people, and that they they are able to receive it and understand it, Lord. I pray that you keep us all humble here tonight. Uh, help us to reflect your love to each other. Help us to engage in fellowship afterwards, and and just and just show um, the love that we have for people because you first loved us, Lord. And I just uh, I thank you for this time. And I pray that you're with us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, uh, what I want to talk about is, what does saving faith look like? Um, <clears throat> I know growing up, I said a prayer to for salvation when I was 13. And, and I believe I was saved. But the question is, are we saved by simply saying a prayer? Now, <clears throat> I would have said yes, because if you look at Romans 10, verse 9, it says this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay, so I confess with my mouth, I believe in my heart. It sounds like a prayer to me, all right? For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Okay, <clears throat> But I want to understand what it means by believe. Thank you. One thing I like, I've heard somebody say this, and I, I like it. it. He says, never read a verse in the Bible. Now, what does he mean by that? Don't single out verses. Always read them in their proper context. And so we want to go through several verses and figure out what does it really mean to believe? Okay, <clears throat> the word believe here is pistuo, I believe it's pronounced, and there's a few different definitions. One is to have faith in. Another one is, another definition is to entrust one's spiritual well-being, to commit or to trust. Okay, so it sounds like it might not necessarily just be an intellectual belief. It sounds like there's an element of trust here. All right. So I want to talk about <coughs> belief that versus trust in. In other words, an intellectual faith versus a relational faith. Here's a question. Does everyone who believes in Jesus go to heaven? Wow, it seems like a no-brainer, right? But it depends what you mean by believe in. <clears throat> We're going to see in Matthew chapter 7 that not everybody who calls Jesus Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's a pretty scary verse. I don't know if you're familiar with that one, but that it always scares me. But what I want to say is that believing that Jesus is the Savior is not enough. But trusting in Jesus is the requirement. And what do I mean? How can I give you an analogy? Well, I like the parachute analogy a lot. Um, parachute analogy is, I can believe with all my heart that a parachute will save me from dying if I fall out of an airplane. But will it save me if I don't put it on? Or pull the string? Simply an intellectual belief that a parachute has the capability of saving me, does that save me from falling out of an airplane? No. Until I put my trust in the parachute and I put it on, it's not going to save me. Same with the life jacket. 
My belief in a life jacket, ability to save me from falling out of a boat and drowning, is not enough. I have to put that life jacket on. And in the same way, Jesus has the ability to save us all, but it requires trusting in him. We must put him on, so to speak. Some biblical support <coughs> from James chapter 2. We're going to go through some more verses, but James 2.19 Someday you have faith and I have works. Show your faith apart from your works, and I'll find my works. And he says, you that God is one, you do. Even demons believe, and they shudder. He says, are they saved? Do they believe? No. Okay. So what does this faith look like? I'm calling it saving faith for this, this sermon. The faith that saves. What does this saving faith look like? Well, I believe that faith I think that talk is cheap, but acts show what live. <clears throat> this is for you guys. Anybody who's married here, <clears throat> before you got, do you believe that your spouse would make a life? Better hear some yeses. <laughs> Thank you, honey. <clears throat> but was your belief that they would make a good spouse enough to make them your husband or wife? Or did you have to take a step further and trust, take a step of trust and ask them to marry you and commit. You had to commit, right? Now I want to tell you this. I know for a fact each and every one of you sitting here has put your devout faith in the chair you're sitting in. And do you know why I know that? Because you're sitting in it. If I stood up here and I told you, oh yeah, that chair is going to hold me up, no problem. And you say, well, Jesse, why don't you sit down then? Oh, no, no, no. I'm not going to do that. No, no, I, I don't want to take any risk. I don't trust the chair is going to hold me up then. So I can say all I want, all day long, I believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus. If there's no evidence of that, why would you think that I actually do? Anybody ever do a trust fall? You know what a trust fall is? I mean... Even though I trust the guy, or if I trust the guy, even if I trust the guy, I'm still nervous, right? Because there's always a chance he might not catch me. But falling backwards shows that your faith in the person who catch you is real, right? If you're not willing to fall, it means you don't trust them. In other words, you can say all day long how much you trust them. Your actions will show it whether you do or not. So faith is proven by the action, or in this case, you know, we're going to talk about good works. Um... So when you truly believe something, you put your trust in it. Going to James, <coughs> sorry, chapter 2, verse 14. <coughs> what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Well, it appears that there is a faith that does not save. What is that faith? A faith without works. But does that mean, because this can be confusing, does that mean we're saved by works? No. Turn, if you can, or and if, I, I wish I had it up here, but I didn't have time to get a PowerPoint. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10, says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. Okay, okay, so we've been saved through faith by grace. And this is not your own doing, this is the gift of God. Okay, by grace. Not a result of works so that no may, one may boast. Okay, so it's not a result of works. Then it goes on to say this, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's the difference. We're saved by grace through faith, so grace comes first, our faith then comes, and we are created for good works. And our faith, if it's genuine, right, will be proven by those works. I know you've heard it probably many times. We're not saved by works. We're saved by faith. But true faith produces good works. I tried to think of um, an, an analogy maybe we could, we could grasp. And I, I don't know if it was a, it's a great one, but I'll, I'll give it anyways. I call it the seed analogy. <clears throat> if I hand you, I call it a seed. I, hand you, I say, here, plant this. You know, it's a good seed. You'll, you'll get whatever you get out of it. How do you know if it's a good seed or even a real seed? What's the way you can tell? You plant it, right? 
You plant it, you water it, and then what? You wait to see what happens. Just like a believer, you see what happens. What comes out of their Christian walk? Now, I'm not talking about perfection, obviously, but I'm talking about growth. Okay? The evidence that the seed was real and was good is when you see it growing. Okay? However, the seed has to come first. In other words, faith has to come first. And then the growth will prove it was a good seed or it was a genuine faith. I hope that analogy helps a little bit. It has, the seed has to come first, and you'll know if it's a good seed by its growth. And if, our, if, if the fruit isn't being produced or if it's not growing, we need to seriously question if the seed is good, just like our faith. If we're not producing fruit, if we're not growing, doesn't mean you're not saved, but you should definitely be questioning what's wrong here. Is my faith genuine? I mean, I don't know of much more that's important than this, is to know with confidence that we're saved. I don't want to be surprised on that day and realize that, oh, I, I didn't actually put my trust in Christ. And so I think there might be a little fear in this, but I think it's a healthy fear. And I think we can learn from it. James 2, I'm going to run through James 2 a little bit. <clears throat> so it says, If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and filled, and you don't give them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So then, also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Faith is dead if there's no works. If faith is works without dead, uh, sorry, if faith without works is dead, what does that say about someone who claims to be a, a believer, a Christian, but has no evidence or fruit to speak of? Is it possible their faith is more of an intellectual one? Is it possible that they haven't actually put their trust in Christ, put Christ on like that parachute? I think it's possible. I think it's something worth looking into for sure. This is, this is eternity we're talking about. Then he says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. And he says, show me your faith apart from your works. And I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. And even the demons believe. Intellectual belief is not enough. Intellectual belief is not enough. Then he says, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, person, that faith apart from works is useless? Okay. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? Now, when he offered up his son on the altar, did it not require faith before the works happened? He had to have faith. But how do we know his faith was real? Because he did the work. He obeyed, obeyed God in that moment. That's how we know his faith was genuine. You see that faith was active along with his works. And faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. He was called a friend of God. Abraham showed his faith to be genuine when he offered his son. <clears throat> you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now, I think that if you read that by itself, what we're just talking about, it could be confusing. He says, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. I think what he's saying is, in context, not by this belief that faith, not by this just intellectual faith, but real faith produces works. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? Now, here's, here's a key point. <clears throat> For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith apart from works is dead. So if you have a body and no spirit, it's a corpse, right? Faith without works is basically a corpse. It has, no per it has no function. It can't do anything. What good is it to believe that Jesus is who he says he is and not do what he says. 
It does no good. So true saving faith is accompanied by works. Without works, without, or sorry, faith without works is, is, is like a body without a spirit. It's dead. And also I, I thought of this question, can you have <coughs> works without faith? Actually reminded me kind of the, of the Pharisees, kind of this thinking of I can earn my way to heaven. And that's not correct either. So there is a, there is a faith without works, which is dead, okay? This is what I'm talking about, that intellectual faith that you're not really putting your trust in Christ. That kind of faith is dead, it's useless. But there's also faith with works that save. So a genuine faith that produce works that save. But there can also be this works-based mentality, which is not true faith. So this works-based mentality is saying, I can, I can, if I just do enough good stuff, God will let me in. I can earn my way. But this is not true faith either. Either Why? Because it's not trusting in the work of Christ. So you can go in both directions with this. A work-based mentality is not putting your trust in Christ because you're not putting your trust in the work of Christ. And I just want to end, end this part by saying, you know, saying something doesn't make it true. If I told you that I was... Um, a police officer, and you just met me, you'd probably say, oh, that's, that's interesting. And then several months goes by, and, and you're wondering, I've never heard him talk about it since. I've never seen him in a uniform. That's kind of weird. And then a few years goes by, and you're like, Where, aren't you a, didn't you say you're a police officer? Yeah, I, I said, well, I've never seen any evidence of it. It would kind of make you wonder, like, that's, that's kind of weird. You start to doubt it. And so, saying something doesn't make it true. Just like saying you believe in Christ or you put your trust in Christ doesn't make it true. It's proven to be true by the actions that follow. All right, First John 4.20. I just want to say this because this, this reminded me of what I was just talking about, about how saying something doesn't make it true. He says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. You know how many people will say they love God and yet they're harboring hate for other people? They're either lying or they're lying to themselves or both. Because love is proven by what? By what we do, our actions. I told my wife I love her and I never showed that love, she would have every reason to doubt me. So how do we know <coughs> that our faith is a saving faith? How do we know that we've actually put our trust in Christ? What is, what's the evidence? I'm going to go through John, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, starting at verse 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. That's scary. There, appear, there's, there appears to be branches in Jesus that do not bear fruit. Now, what I think this could mean is there are people that profess Christ but aren't really in Christ. Or maybe they're... Their faith is that intellectual faith, and they're not producing any fruit. They believe that Jesus is, is the Messiah or God, but they don't live that way, so there's no fruit. <clears throat> then he says, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now, so we're talking about how do we know? Well, here's one evidence. Does anybody here ever feel like God has pruned them, so to speak? Now, <clears throat> did that pruning allow you or enable you to produce more fruit afterwards? That's called growth. That is a sign or an evidence that you are trusting in Christ, okay? This is very important. Don't miss this. We need to, we need to look for these evidences. If they're not there, we need to start getting, getting, getting our trust back in Christ. <clears throat> Next he says, Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. 
as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. So Jesus is the vine. We need to abide in him. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, he says. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So I ask the question, well, what does abiding in Jesus look like? <clears throat> I think there's a few things. I mean, there's many things, but I, I listed a few. And it goes back to um, 1 Corinthians, um, hope, faith, and love. I think we need to put our hope in him. We need to recognize that he is the only way for us to be uh, with the Father, that he's the only way to salvation, that he is the only true hope. So we need to put our hope in him. Two, we need to trust in him, which is faith, but not just an intellectual faith, a real, I'm going to prove to you that I trust you by what I do. I'm going to prove it to you. And loving him, putting him first before everything. Are we abiding in Christ? Are there any of these evidences in our life? And he goes on to say, If anyone does not abide in me, <clears throat> he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Sobering. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. But uh, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. The one thing I notice is that dead branches don't bear fruit. So if we're not producing fruit uh, or good works, then we need to ask ourselves, is our faith real? Are we really trusting in Christ? Is our relationship with him intellectual or relational? So the sign that we're not in him is there's no fruit. And even if there was, let's say, you know, I can probably think of a few things, you know, that maybe I could call fruit in my life. If you're not really sure, you should still be concerned. Because what if you had a, a plant that was like, well, I think it's growing a tomato, but I'm not sure if that's a tomato. It's supposed to be a tomato plant, but it's not growing very fast. It, it kind of looks dilapidated. Well, maybe that means there's something wrong with it, right? So we've got to be self-examining our walk. That's my point there. And... Here's, the, here's my favorite part of this part of the verse. When we bear much fruit, it proves we are his disciples. Why? He said, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So how do you prove you're his disciples? That you bear much fruit. And this also glorifies God. So we can have strong confidence that we are saved when we are trusting in Christ and bearing fruit. Now I want to <clears throat> self-reflect a little bit on our walk and go through, remember I mentioned Matthew 7. Um, I know Jarek has or talked about this, preached on it, um, and he always talks about it because it's one of those verses, uh, 7, uh, 20 or 21, where it's pretty scary what Jesus says. And I was reading Luke 6, which is actually the parallel verses. <clears throat> and he's talking about, you know, uh, no, no good tree bears bad fruit, neither does a bad tree bear good fruit. Um, and what he says in verse 46 in, in Luke 6 is, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and, and not do what I tell you? Why do you call me Lord and you don't even do what I tell you? Obviously, you're not, you, don't, you either don't think I'm Lord or I'm not really your Lord. And then he talks about, you know, um, the, the wise man building a house. One <clears throat> dug deep, laid on a foundation of rock. When the flood came, it could not shake it. Um, but the foolish man built his house on the sand. But this verse didn't say sand. And I go, wait a minute, there's a verse that says sand. Well, it's in Matthew 7. So I went to Matthew 7, and I'm really glad I did because I wasn't even thinking about this. So I'll just start reading <coughs> Matthew 7, starting at verse 13. Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. He says, beware of false prophets 
who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their, guess what? Fruits. You recognize them by their fruits. Their fruits show who they really are, as they do us. He says, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, and the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. And every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you'll recognize them by their fruits. This is why it is so dangerous to put your trust in a prayer that you said. I'm not saying the prayer you said didn't lead to your salvation. I'm not saying you weren't genuine. I'm saying that for so many people, they think they're saved simply because they came to the altar, they said the right words, and now they're, they're golden. And they don't have to worry about it now. I want to tell you that's dangerous. That's the most dangerous thing I can think of, to think that you're saved when you're not. The prayer doesn't save you. What saves you is the trust in Christ, and that's lifelong. And it's not like you're earning it along the way. That's just your way of life because you actually have trust in Christ. Trusting Christ saves you, and good fruit will be the evidence that your faith is genuine. This is reiterated time and time again throughout Scripture, and yet we miss it because, like I said, we cherry-pick verses. I want to say this, that there are no verses in the Bible. The verses were added five, six hundred years ago so that we could navigate the text easier. That's why we can't just pluck lines out. We have to read it in context. And so this is what I'm trying to do here. Verse 21. Here's where it gets scary. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. (coughs) But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, Did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. (coughs) Sorry, we had class here. I've been speaking for hours. Um, (coughs) So back to Luke 6 again. He says, you know, in that line he says why do you call me lord lord and and not do what i tell you and now the parallel verse he's saying not everyone who says to me lord lord will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my father in heaven in other words we're supposed to be obedient okay he calls them workers of lawlessness even though they claimed to have prophesied in his name cast out demons done mighty works whether they really did or not i i think that's a moot point because the point is you you didn't put your trust in me You weren't obedient. You weren't following me. I want to say again, this is not about perfection. I'm not saying follow him perfectly. I'm saying follow him. And if you stumble, get back up and follow him. And if you stumble, just keep going. So not every believer is really putting their trust in Christ. He's saying because it seems like they're believers. They're calling them Lord. They think they've done all these things in his name. Verse 24, as everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat that house down, or beat on that house, but it did not fall. Because it had been founded on the rock, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, beat against the house, and it fell, and the, and the great was the fall of it. Now, what's the difference here? Everything's basically the same. They both heard, but one of them did, and one of them did not do it. They both heard the words, one of them did it, one of them did not do it. One of them was obedient, one was not. So what, <clears throat> when I read this, I thought, okay, what specifically are you asking of us to do, Jesus? What specifically? I mean, you could say, you know, hear his words and, and do them, but which words? I mean, there's so many. You, you said a, a lot of things. And I thought, well, maybe if I go back a few verses, maybe there will be a clue. So I went back to verse 12. In verse 12, this is where he starts this whole thing. 
He says, So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like some kind of commandment he gave? Does that not sound like the great commandment in Mark 12, I think it is here? To love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, to, and to love your neighbor as yourself. If you do, this fulfills the law. That's what he's saying. That's how he starts this whole thing. He says, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. This fulfills it. So the whole base of what he's saying to do is love your neighbor, love God. That's what he's asking. Why? Because that encompasses everything. Everything we do out of obedience, everything we do in love, true love, is going to be obedient. If I truly love you, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Um, I'm not going to beat up on you, but I will challenge you lovingly because I care about your eternal destiny. It all stems from love. So what he's saying is, love your neighbor, fulfill this great commandment, hear what I say and do them, and you'll be a wise man. And when the floods come, your house will not fall. So it seems like Jesus is talking, that saying that love is, is really the foundation here. So going back <coughs> to verse 21 and 23, through 23 that, that scary verse there, you know, I thought about, you know, so what if we could prophesy? They said, you know, we prophesied in your name, we cast out demons. Okay, so what? What if we could prophesy? What if we could cast out demons, do all these mighty works? What does 1 Corinthians say about this kind of thing? It says it means nothing if it's not done in love. So even if these people were doing real miracles, or however they could, it doesn't matter if they weren't doing it in love. First Corinthians 13, 1 through 3 says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And I, if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, then I am nothing. Even if I give away all I have, and deliver up my body to be burned and have not love, I gain nothing. So I want you guys to examine your own hearts and do this. Seriously, don't forget to do this. Do it now. Um, do it while we pray. Do it when you go home. Are we producing fruit? Have we really put our trust in Christ? And how can we produce more fruit? How can we trust Christ even more with our lives? Through studying these verses, I, I conclude that real faith, real saving faith, is a trust in Christ that produces good fruit and is based in true love for God and for people. Do you have saving faith? Just I want you to contemplate that for a little bit. And um, this opened my eyes too. You know, when I was reading Matthew 7, we've, we've wrestled with it for a long time. I know I have. Um, I think what he's saying there is that some of us have this idea that we're saved because we've said a prayer or perhaps we believe that Jesus is the Savior, but we're not doing what he says. We're not growing. Um, we're just kind of on standby. That's That's not what... Christ is talking about here. He's talking about a genuine faith that produces works, good works, is not works based, but produces good works because of a genuine faith. I'm just going to close in prayer, guys. Uh, thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity to speak truth, and uh, I just pray that it's received, and I pray that we examine our hearts, Lord. I pray that we um, we know whether we're saved or at least have confidence that we're saved. And if there's any doubt, help us to come to you, Lord, and, um, and just bring it to you and, and, and deliver us from a lie if, if we're believing a lie. And uh, deliver us from, from thinking that we're saved if we're really not. 
And if this makes us uncomfortable, Lord, just please have grace for us and help us to, to put our trust in you and to, and to see the evidence of that, Lord, and so that we can be confident uh, that on that day that uh, we will be with you, Lord. Uh, I pray for these people, and uh, I thank you so much for their time. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we continue to worship. Father, as we close in prayer, I thank you that we can gather, we can learn your word, we can be together in this home, your house, Lord. I think of saving faith and how you've given us a, a heart of flesh. You've taken that heart of stone. You've renewed our mind. I think of what it says in Luke 9, that uh, to be your follower, we must deny ourselves and pick up the cross daily. Help us not to selfishly and pridefully hang on to our lives because you say we will lose it. But if we give it up for your sake, we will save it. So I just ask that you can speak to each one of us here. Thank you for everybody that came out tonight. Pray for a good fellowship. And I pray, Lord, that uh, 
Just everybody be safe as they make their way home. Thank you. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen.